championship season began on a summery September afternoon in Soldier Field. Quarterback Jim McMahon went right after the opposing Buccaneers, and with key blocks from guards Mark Bortz, number 62, and Kirk Becker, number 79, the Chicago quarterback wound up and threw to wide receiver Dennis McKinnon for the Bears' first touchdown. However, the Chicago defense was uncharacteristically generous this opening day, giving up four first-half touchdowns that earned the Bucks a 28-17 lead. But on the second play of the second half, cornerback Leslie Frazier, number 21, picked off a Steve DeBerg pass. And from then on, it was all Bears, who shut out Tampa the rest of the way. With the Buccaneers in dry dock, McMahon charted the Bears through smooth waters with two scoring passes and two touchdown runs to earn Chicago an opening day win. After this game, only one club would score more points on the Bears the rest of the year. In the season's second week, the Bears faced their eventual Super Bowl opponents in a game which, on the surface, looked to be favoring the Patriots. For one of the few times all season, running star Walter Payton was held in check, and some of the Patriots treated their hosts in a less-than-cordial fashion. But appearances can be deceiving. Despite a few hard hits, it was New England who was dismantled. The Bears held the Patriots to only 27 yards rushing while logging three interceptions and six sacks. New England spent only 19 seconds in Chicago territory all day, while Bear touchdowns by Matt Suey and Dennis McKinnon, number 85, were more than enough to gain the win. In just a few months, Chicago would beat New England even more convincingly. When the legendary Dick Butkus joined fellow Hall of Famer O.J. Simpson to watch Chicago's Thursday night matchup in Minnesota, he didn't expect to see his former mates fall behind. But in the third quarter, the Bears were trailing the Vikings 17-9. It was then that coach Mike Ditka summoned an ailing Jim McMahon off the bench in hopes of sparking the team. A blitzing Minnesota linebacker ran into a crunching block from Walter Payton bringing McMahon to hit Willie Galt for a 70-yard touchdown on his very first play. In just under seven minutes, McMahon fired three touchdown passes, rallying Chicago to another come-from-behind victory. To a nationwide TV audience, this was the first glimpse of a team that was charting a course to a championship. Loyal Chicagoans had already sensed the special qualities of their heroes, and they were made quite clear to everyone, including the opposing Redskins in the fourth game of the season. After spotting Washington a 10-0 lead, the Bears roared back on the legs of kick returner Willie Galt. Galt's 99-yard return, the third longest in team history, sparked a run of 45 unanswered points. Meanwhile, the Bears showed why Chicago is renowned as hog butcher to the world, as they chopped, sliced, and diced the Redskin offense. Number 27, cornerback Mike Richardson capped the Bears' defensive dominance with a coast-to-coast -coast interception return that set up one of Chicago's many scores, including a touchdown reception by tight end Emery Moorhead, number 87. The Bears used this point explosion to become the NFC's highest scoring team, a distinction they would still hold at season's end. Walter Payton hauled in one touchdown from McMahon, then returned the favor in kind as the future Hall of Famer used his darting quickness and accurate arm to complete the eighth touchdown pass of his pro career. Chicago handed the Redskins their worst defeat in 24 years and had fun while doing it. Where one Windy City team of the recent past found success in winning ugly, 
the Bears were discovering the joys of winning crazy. But in a rematch at Tampa Bay, the annoying Buccaneers temporarily put frowns on the Bears' faces as they bolted to a 12-3 halftime lead. Then Jim McMahon and Dennis McKinnon combined to help erase Tampa Bay's advantage. The spirit of sharing carried over to the defense as well, as secondary members Leslie Frazier, Gary Fensick, and Dave Dewerson combined their talents to short-circuit any Buccaneer comeback flyer. a trio to advance the ball on this interception, but a solo act advanced the Bears to victory. Walter Payton is 31 years old, but he's still a money player who can stop on a dime and go for broke in a single motion. Payton scored twice in the final period as Chicago chalked up their fourth come from behind win in five weeks. Ahead lay the game the Bears had been pointing towards since the end of last season. When the 49ers pounded the Bears 23 to nothing to win the NFC title in 1984, it was a defeat that fueled Chicago's desire to become champions in 1985. They took a giant step in that direction as the offense systematically dissected the defending world champs, mounting scoring drives on three of their first four possessions. Chicago raced to a 16 to nothing lead, then pounced on every mistake made by the San Francisco offense. Both the Bears defenders and the Niners themselves turned the contest into a comedy of errors. Then in the final moments, coach Mike Ditka paid San Francisco back with interest for last year's defeat by unleashing enormous rookie defensive tackle William Perry as a running back. Perry would have ample opportunity to hone his rushing skills later in the year. But for the moment, the finest ball carrier in the business, Walter Payton, was the best man for the job. Payton scored twice and ran for 132 yards as Chicago exacted a harsh measure of revenge against San Francisco. The 6-0 Bears could now truly sense that their star runner might finally get his chance to be on a championship team. Certainly the legacy of Payton's career proved that no athlete was more deserving. In his first 10 years in the league, the Chicago Bears running back had pursued the NFL's all-time leading rusher, Jim Brown. As the 1984 season began, Payton was finally within striking distance of Brown's record and closing hard. This journey of so many yards had begun 10 years earlier with a single game. Payton's career began in 1975 against the Colts, and he failed to gain a single yard on eight carries. Since then, however, he has gained at least 1,200 yards rushing in every season except one. What made this achievement even greater was the fact it was built with inadequate passing and sporadic blocking that didn't make anything easy for number 34. missed only one game during his career, and no one has ever run quite like this amazing athlete. As a runner, Walter Payton is different. He's not like Dorsett was, he's not like O.J., he's not like Jim Brown. Walter is movement and energy. He's motion. Uh, he's excitement. I mean, he is strong and he is fast and he's powerful. It's like somebody once said that when, when the good Lord was going to make a halfback, he just chiseled a certain type of body and he gave it to Walter Payton. Walter Payton finally stood on the threshold of pro football history against the New Orleans Saints on October 7, 1984. 
right, here we go. McMahon asked for quiet. Second play of the second half from the 21-yard line. Walter needs two to break the record. High formation. Quick pitch to Walter. Looking for the record. Cuts back. He's got it. He's out of it at 25 to the 26-yard line. Walter Payton becomes the National Football League all-time leading rusher surpassing Jim Brown. And that's the equivalent to Hank Aaron breaking Babe Ruth's all-time home run record. I've never well, seen Well, Walter Payton, one chase had ended. Another one continued. The Bears had never won a division championship since number 34 had come to Chicago. With his place in pro football history secured, Walters squared his shoulders and headed the 84 Bears towards their first division title since 1963. In 1985, the supporting cast was finally there, a team as talented as Peyton himself. And I mean no offense to any of the great players who have ever played the game, but I think he's the most complete football player that I've ever seen, and maybe that's ever played the game of football. At last, Walter Peyton sensed his championship dreams might be dreams no longer. On the Bears' first Monday night appearance of the season, opposing Green Bay jumped out to a quick 7-0 lead. But the defense quickly slammed the door thereafter as Pro Bowl-bound safety Dave Dewerson, number 22, made one of three big turnovers at Green Bay's expense. Linebacker Wilbur Marshall, number 58, stole another Packer pass, setting up the first of two scores from Walter Payton. Walter cracked the 100-yard mark again, and with this touchdown became the Bears' all-time leading scorer. But the points that made the biggest impression on the nation came from William Perry, whose cannonball blast set in motion an amazing story that was destined to create an American folk hero. A week later against Minnesota, Perry played a more traditional role and collected his first professional quarterback sack. Tommy Kramer was chilled by the refrigerator, then singed by number 95 Richard Dent, who brushed Kramer's arm just as he released the pass deep in Vikings territory. Number 55, Otis Wilson's interception return broke open what had been a tight 13-7 contest. And this wasn't the only wobbly throw that resulted in a Bears touchdown. Jim McMahon served up a knuckleball that would have made Phil Necro jealous, but it fluttered into the hands of Dennis McKinnon for six Chicago points. McMahon's second scoring pass of the game was delivered to Walter Payton, who also produced another 100-yard rushing performance. The Bears' recipe for victory was once again their usual perfect blend of offense and defense. Reason enough for Chicago's perfect 8-0 record at the midway point of the season. The defense helped maintain that unblemished record in a return engagement with Green Bay. Number 99, Dan Hampton, logged quarterback sacks from both the end and tackle positions. One of many different defensive looks that confused the Packers all day. When Hampton wasn't storming into the backfield, it was number 76, Steve McMichael, whose safety helped trim a fourth quarter Packer lead. In yet another come-from-behind contest, it was Walter Payton leading the way with a season-high 192 yards to go along with a winning touchdown in Chicago's toughest game of the year. Once more, William Perry made headlines with a first touchdown catch of his career, giving new meaning to the term wide receiver. score versus Green Bay had done it. The refrigerator had truly captured the country's imagination. <laughs>
William Perry was a symbol, a big, big symbol, of the Bears' attempt to put fun back into football. Well, I didn't even know him, uh, you know, I'd never seen him, never heard of him. Uh, he came up to the office when we picked him, he was, uh, had about a size 60-something coat or something like that, he was a big guy. The thing that made me mad about him, he came to camp and he couldn't practice but one time and he went in the heap and it made a lot of people mad. But Bear head coach Mike Ditka had an idea. For the go-ahead score, in motion more head to the right side, hand off to Perry, crushes the right side, the line, touchdown! <laughs> on that fateful October evening, William Perry set out on a course that would transcend football and become folklore. Look at William Perry doing the high five! We got the great Walter Payton and Jim McMahon too But at the goal line they call in 72 Cause there ain't nothing more feared Than the attack of a 330 pound running back They call in the prince When they're on the goal line They call in the prince And it's six points every time <laughs> I think a lot of underdogs in society relate to William. Uh, he's a guy that's worked hard, he got his weight down, he did everything we asked, and right now he's an ideal citizen, really. In Chicago, perhaps, but elsewhere, folks weren't quite so fond of the refrigerator. William Perry sparked a revolution. Corpulence came out of the closet. Cholesterol was now king. Fat was where it was at. Refrigerator Perry, he's my main man. If he can get him to the Super Bowl, nobody can. I said L-U-P-E-R, Super Bowl. This calorie gallery called themselves the Refrigerettes, a group with a minimum weight requirement of 200 pounds. Of course, you know, we have free membership in the Fridge Perry Fan Club for those who weigh over 300 pounds. And what is that number up to? Right, and that's still growing, too. We're getting, uh, you know, three or four of those with every batch of letters. And we have 138 right now. 138. And the heaviest person is... Uh... Yeah, still the first guy, in fact. Uh, Dennis, Dennis Kemp Dennis. from out in East Dundee at 420. Still 420 pounds. Man. William Perry could also do his ball carrying as a member of the Chicago Bears defense. This well-rounded athlete was not only a household appliance, but now a household name. The Bears, last of the NFL's unbeaten, had little trouble in maintaining perfection as the storming Chicago defense bludgeoned the Lions, holding them to a paltry 106 yards in total offense. With Jim McMahon on the bench with an injury, backup quarterback Steve Fuller skillfully guided the Bears' run-oriented attack, scoring twice and handing off to Calvin Thomas for a third touchdown. The Bears racked up 250 rushing yards to earn their 10th win of the year. A week later, they played their most dominating game of the season. Dallas turned the ball over five times, which led to four Bears scores, including Mike Richardson's 36-yard interception return. With quarterback Jim McMahon still out with injuries, Chicago relied on their ground attack to supply the offensive firepower. Calvin Thomas had to run over his own man to get into the end zone. But when he bowled over this Dallas defender, he allowed number 29, Dennis Gentry, an equal opportunity to score. Scoring was something Dallas only dreamed about as number 95, Richard Dent, led the Chicago charge, which never allowed the Cowboys within the Bears' 38-yard line. 
With his offensive lineman manhandled by Chicago, Dallas quarterback Danny White was at the mercy of safety Dave Dewerson for one of six Bears sacks. The refrigerator might have been the Bears' big story, but he's not the only modern appliance in Chicago's Hell's Kitchen defense, which carved up the Cowboys' offense. Chicago waited 14 years for a victory against Dallas and more than made up for lost time by handing the Cowboys their worst defeat in team history. With the win, Chicago clinched their second straight NFC Central title and had the rest of the league singing the blues. No matter how Bears fans were now dressing, no matter how unusual their apparel, the most stylish fellows in the Windy City were the defensive players. William Perry's pursuit of excellence included lateral pursuit, much to the Falcons' surprise. Against Atlanta, Perry's east-west mobility was excellent, but for north-south running, there is none better than Walter Payton. For the seventh straight week, Payton rushed for 100 yards, tying a league record. Also providing some impressive numbers were the men of the defense. They recorded their second straight shutout, allowing Falcon quarterbacks the short pass only. In the last 13 quarters, the Bears had allowed only three points. By year's end, they would permit less than two touchdowns a game, lowest in the league. An elaborate defensive strategy and great athletes were what made these new monsters of the midway so deadly. The Chicago Bears, pro football's imperial defense. <laughs> No quarterback is safe. The scenario goes like this. First, the bewildered quarterback is helped to his feet and his senses by his teammates. The decision to continue is not made willingly. Then comes the second and final act, unconditional surrender. In 1985, the Bears defense dwarfed the rest of the NFL. They not only defeated opponents with outstanding athletes, they demoralized them with confusing alignments and relentless pressure. They run several different alignments, and they move their defensive linemen around to different positions. They have the ideal personnel to handle that style of defense. They have good linebackers and a good secondary. But I think the key to that whole thing is those defensive linemen. Right! Sit Led right. by Dan Hampton, Steve McMichael, and Richard Dent, number 95. The Bears have the league's most powerful four-man front. The foundation of the NFL's toughest defense to run against. But Chicago's overwhelming success is the result of their pass rush. The key to playing dominating defense in the NFL is pressure on the quarterback. It sounds simple, but no team in the league exerts the mental and physical strain on the passing game that the Bears do. To stop a passing game, uh, you can't stop it unless you put pressure on it. Now, some people are good enough to put it on with a three-man rush. Well, we're not. In fact, I don't know what we're good enough to put it on with a four-man rush. If we have to send eight, we'll send eight. But we're not going to let you sit back there and pick us apart. The safety blitz, like this one by number 22, Dave Dewerson, is an important part of Ryan's pressure package. But it's the Bears' basic defense, the 46, that causes offenses the most problems. This alignment positions six men on the line of scrimmage, with linebackers Wilbur Marshall, number 58, and Otis Wilson, number 55, on the same side. Both will blitz, giving Chicago a six-man pass rush. The double blitz pressures the offense into blocking confusion. Two blockers respond to Marshall's inside rush, leaving Wilson, number 55, free on the outside to sack the quarterback. Ryan's blitz schemes are not predictable. 
Here again in the 46, Wilson and Marshall are positioned on the same side. Again, at the snap of the ball, both will blitz. This time, the offense, keeping a back and the tight end in the block, picks up Marshall and Wilson. But that leaves Mike Singletary, number 50, the third blitzing linebacker and the seventh pass rusher, with a clear path to the quarterback. Buddy forces the offense into uh, keeping a lot of uh, backs in, keep the tight ends in. Uh, they do all kinds of uh, east-west blocking, and we more or less confuse them more than they confuse us. And when you get the offense on the defensive, then I think half the game is already won. We learned the system, became experienced with it, and once you become comfortable with it and it becomes second nature to do all the reaction on the run, you're allowed to become more physical. You stop thinking out there, you just start doing your job. With the talent that we've had on the defense the last three or four years, with Wilbur Marshall and, and uh, Singletary in the middle, and you know just all the great athletes, in addition to some you know people who are just fitting into the system, it's allowed us to become a much more aggressive and dominating defense. The man who coordinates the complex bear defense on the field is middle linebacker Mike Singletary. Singletary is the NFL's sharpest defensive thinker a player whose mentality is matched by his ability. Mike is the soul of the defense. He's always played with a great deal of heart. You know, he's, he's a good athlete, he's got good size, but his, his greatest attribute is his heart and his mind. He's a complete football player. He can, he can do it all. He's the best linebacker in the National Football League, and I don't think there's any question about it. He runs our defense for us. Every coach should get the opportunity to coach Mike Singletary because he's such a dedicated kid. I mean, he doesn't play lip service to it. He really works at it. Singletary's worship of the work ethic is the driving force pushing the Bears' defense. He's the rock in the middle, the shrewd student who understands what it takes to play dominating defensive football. When you're striving for perfection, you're not going to be satisfied at doing okay. You want to go all the way. You want to do uh, the small things that maybe uh, your competitors aren't. In order to do that, you have to get out there every play and just do that a that, uh, little bit extra and put in a little bit more uh, mentally and physically when you step out there on the field. I think that's you know, the, the biggest reason that we are so successful because we just we want to strive to be the best, first of all, and then just go on from there. In 1985, the Bears' defense was the best. They have more outstanding athletes than anybody else. And a chunky kid called the Refrigerator proved that he belonged next to the Singletaries, the Hamptons, and the Deaths. It's pro football's supreme defense. Unnerving pressure that cripples offenses, producing turnovers, and sometimes touchdowns. The question is, can anybody get in the end zone against this defense? The answer to that question came in what proved to be an unlucky 13th week of the season for the Bears. Journeying to Florida to play Miami, the Dolphins had ample incentive to win. Or it was the Dolphins themselves who held the distinction as the NFL's only team to enjoy a perfect 17-0 season, a feat accomplished back in 1972. On the arm of Dan Marino, Miami moved the football on Chicago as no team would do before or after in 1985. The Dolphins scored on each of their first five possessions to take a 31-10 halftime lead. Even when the Bears narrowed the gap, Miami got the benefit of a fortunate bounce as a twice-tipped pass that could have been picked off became instead a touchdown for Dolphin wide receiver Mark Clayton. Chicago got in the last word when quarterback Steve Fuller hit wide receiver Ken Marjoram for a 19-yard touchdown. But it was not enough to catch the Dolphins, who picked this particular game to have one of their better defensive performances of the season. With the victory, Miami preserved the franchise's exclusivity on perfect seasons, 
For the Bears, it meant the first, last, and only time they would know defeat in 1985. One consolation of the Dolphin game was that Walter Payton extended his 100-yard rushing string to an NFL record eight games, a record he would add to against the Colts the following week. Jim McMahon, making his first start in over a month, directed a short-range passing game that kept Payton fresh and gobbled up the clock with time-consuming drives. The offense was efficient enough because the Chicago defense returned to its usual form as the Bad News Bears. A week later, the defense was even more impressive. Journeying to the Meadowlands to battle the playoff-bound Jets, Chicago limited Ken O'Brien, the league's top-rated quarterback, to just 122 passing yards. Walter Payton was held to under 100 yards rushing for the first time in 10 weeks, but his knack for the big play kept the Bears a step ahead of the New Yorkers throughout the afternoon. One touchdown was all Chicago needed to earn the win. That occurred when quarterback Jim McMahon spotted tight end Tim Reitman with a seven-yard scoring pass. McMahon's aim was also true in the regular season finale in Detroit. While Jim clowned with the cameras, linebacker Otis Wilson and the rest of the Bears' top-ranked defense simply toyed with the Lions. registered six sacks, numerous TKOs, and recovered four fumbles, although they led by only six to three at the half. But that situation was easily remedied when number 29, Dennis Gentry, returned the second half kickoff for a touchdown. Gentry's 94-yard run back, coupled with a defensive touchdown, provided all the incentive McMahon needed to get the Bears' offense rolling. McMahon took matters into his own hands and ran for a 14-yard score to lead Chicago to a lopsided victory. The Bears closed out the regular season with a league-leading 15-1 record. Now it was on to the playoffs and a world championship. When George Hallis founded the Bears franchise back in 1920, he planted the first seeds of what was to become the National Football League. The record shows that Hallis and his Bears won numerous titles and world championships. But what endures most are the character and ideals of pro football's founding fathers. Those who are part of the Bears today continue to carry on the proud legacy of Papa Bear. These people in the team's front office are as much a part of the championship success as those who suit up to play each Sunday. From administration to publicity, scouting to medical care, the behind-the-scenes efforts by these members of the Bears family were a major reason for the team's success in 1985. The men who molded the talented players into the NFL's most dominant team were a seasoned staff of assistant coaches, each of whom contributed their experience and knowledge to make the Bears champions. Their fiery leader was the man George Hallis had hand-picked for the Bears' head coaching job, Mike Ditka, a coach who embodied many of the qualities of Hallis himself.
I don't think you ask any quarter, you give any quarter. You play from the bottom up to top down, whatever way you want to say it. Maybe that's old fashioned, but I think there's a place for it. Damn it, Keith! How can you do that? How can you do that? He breaks everybody down so that, you, first of all, you understand you're doing what he wants and you have to be disciplined. It's almost like going to boot camp. Damn it, Steve, why am I up there and run it? To me, that's just the, the psychology of life of how to get the best out of somebody, how to knock them down when they get too big for their britches, and how to raise them up when they're, when they're down. Talking does not win football games. <coughs> They, they did all the talking last week about what they were, what they could do. Don't say anything, okay? We got a tough football game coming up with the Mike Rams. Ditka coaches from the heart as well as the chalkboard. He once broke his hand, smashing it in anger after a game. He now wears a shirt and tie to remind him to keep his composure. But clothes could never hide his distaste for losing at anything. I remember we were we were playing gin rum, and it was one of those days where the cards were really coming, and they're just I'm getting good hands right and left because that's the only way I can win at the game. But I ended up and, I, and I'm winning, and it just keeps going, keeps going, keeps going, and and Mike got so mad, and I you know there's a guy I didn't know, and all of a sudden he takes the deck of cards, and he just rips the cards half in two, and threw the cards, took the chair, threw the chair, and the chair, you know, uh, leg stuck in the wall. And I mean I was. So now, who is this guy, you know? In 1963, Ditka was a tight end for the Bears, and his fighting spirit drove Chicago to a world title. Now, 22 years later, that same spirit unified the team he coached. I think that he's brought back the toughness in the Chicago Bear organization. Ask no quarter, give no quarter, and keep that chip on your shoulder and don't take it off until after the Super Bowl, and that's what we're trying to do. This attitude was a carryover from Ditka's playing days with the 63 Bears, the last Chicago team to win an NFL championship. The championship year, two years before I got there in 63, they just always came up with characters that were... Uh, tough son of a guns, you know, and they and they played like it was supposed to be played. We were completely loose. I mean, we were loose the whole year. I mean, we just, we laughed at everything. And how we won, I don't know. We got every break going. We had felt the opposition about 10 points. Atkins led the monsters of the Midway, football's meanest and stingiest defense. A unit comprised of men who worked hard, yet played hard too. But on Sundays, the Bears were sober, sullen and deadly serious. When you came to play the Bears in Wrigley Field, it was very simple. When you had to go up against guys like Doug Atkins, Stan Jones, Ed Obradovich, Bill George, Richie Pettibone, Larry Morris, you had some of those gorillas looking at you. Come hell or high water, the Bears were going to put a physical beating on you. I don't care whether you won or lost. You're going to know you in the damnedest game you ever been in your whole life. Unlike a majority of championship teams, the Chicago players who got most of the attention were on the defensive unit. We proved defense can win it. We can win a championship on defense. Not that our offense didn't produce, you know, from the 20 to 20, they were fantastic. Slight problem trying to get into the end zone. There were stars on offense with names like Morris, Caceres, and Gallimore, but the defense seldom missed any chance to needle the men with the football. The rivalry was mostly from the defensive team. We, the offensive team never paid much attention to all that. It was just something, the defensive team seemed to need something to gear themselves up, like you're talking about practices and so forth. Well, man, we were out there just to do a job. We gave people a lot of fits offensively. Even though we averaged uh, the 14 points a game, our turnover ratio was the smallest in the league. So offensively speaking, we felt, you know, we did our part, we felt they did their part. They were more colorful, you might say. The Chicago defense was both colorful and lethal in the NFL championship game. Playing in the nine-degree ice box of Wrigley Field, the Bears beat the New York Giants 14 to 10, or Chicago's first championship since 1946. To play with these guys, that goddamn it, they were men. Uh, 
word was divine. Uh, we went out on the football field and they knocked the hell out of people. And I'm so thankful that I had the opportunity to play with, uh, with the people I did in 63. Great people. Two years after that last world title, the city of Chicago was hit by a sweeping tide of bear mania. From the North Shore to the Gold Coast, the new monsters of the Midway were caught up in the fever of a town gone crazy over a team. We're supposed to be crazy, and people think we're crazy, and once, once we hit the field, they're expecting something crazy. It's like a pack of wild dogs. You know, if one of them's mean, they're all gonna be mean. To a city of battered dreams and near misses, the Bears restored a sense of civic pride and a fat dose of comic relief. With the beginning of the playoffs, Bear Mania hit epidemic proportion. Whatever we got on our minds, get rid of it, think football. One thing, 60 minutes. McMahon back to Bell, pitches the right side. He's got a fine time. Great, 20 to nothing, Chicago Bears. Super Bear, Super Bowl, Super Bear, Super Bowl. The Bears took their first step towards a title by crushing the New York Giants, the same team they had beaten to win a championship in 1963. This is not the end of the road. I mean, there's work to be done. There's miles to go. That's the way the poem goes. We've got a little way to go yet. And I tell you, it's going to get better. Well, like I said, uh, the best is yet to come. It really is. The best was still to come. But it would have been hard convincing the Giants, who fell to Chicago in frozen soldier field. They discovered that these bad news bears could be bad weather bears as well. The Giants started off quickly, moving 45 yards on their first four plays of this NFC Divisional Playoff game. But when the Bears forced and recovered number 26 Rob Carpenter's fumble, this promising drive ended up in the deep freeze. The first period saw the Giants continue to walk through a winter blunderland, and when Sean Landetta kicked a minus five yard punt, number 23 Sean Gale returned it for a touchdown. Landetta would later claim that his shank was caused by a gust of wind, but another look at the play suggests that the punter may have been unnerved by the heavily stacked left side of the Chicago rush unnerved enough to drop the ball low and nose down toward his instep. While Gale recorded the shortest punt return for a touchdown in NFL playoff history, Bill Sims suffered through one of the longest afternoons in postseason athletes. Sims was sacked six times, and his principal nemesis was number 95, Richard Dent, who registered three and a half of those sacks. Chicago's front line stunted often, and when Dent ran a loop, Carl Nelson, number 63, could not get over to block Dent quickly enough to prevent the sack. Bears were in Sims' face the entire game as the Giants failed to make a first down in nine of their first 11 possessions. It took a while for Mike Ditka's offense to get on track too, but in the second half, the Bears were able to solve New York's defense and extend their 7-0 halftime lead. Chicago's offensive line of Covert, Bortz, Hilgenberg, Thayer, and Van Horn showed intimidating New York defenders such as Lawrence Taylor, number 56, that when push comes to shove, they could be pretty intimidating too. Jim McMahon was never sacked in the contest, and although he completed only four passes over the final two periods, a pair of them accounted for touchdowns, both by Dennis McKinnon. Thank you. 
knowing Sims now had no choice but to pass constantly Chicago Blitz frequently. Here, number 50, Mike Singletary, recorded an easy sack. The Giants were simply not equal to the task of thwarting these blitzes, as number 30, Tony Galbraith's missed block on Gary Fencing, number 45, demonstrated. Defense Chicago style helped earn the victory. Now the Bears were approaching the gun lap in the race to Super Bowl XX. Their last hurdle, the Los Angeles Rams. On the frozen shores of Lake Michigan and Florida's tropical coast, two championships would be decided. From a sodden Orange Bowl. It's been raining here all week long. Patriots have not won here in 18 straight games. This one is for the right to play in Super Bowl 20. Soldier Field in Chicago, the NFC Championship, and a trip to New Orleans for Super Bowl 20. It's going to be very tough to throw the ball and very tough to kick the ball because of that swirling wind. Why don't they put a dome over this place? 67 WMAQ. Where we're ready. Do the bear defensive bark. You ready, Doug? Everybody bark together. You ready? Okay, let's go. The Bears Mike Ditka and the Patriots Ray Berry, two men who had battled as players years before, would lead their teams on the final step to New Orleans. Super Bowl dream fade, the Bears and Patriots settled in and let their fantasy take flight.
think they are. Wow. Mike can beat us in the fourth quarter. Fourth quarter, can't no one beat us. It means that they have destroyed the Orange Bowl, King. Put it away today by beating the Dolphins, winning the AFC Championship, and opening the door to the Super Bowl in New Orleans, Louisiana, in just two weeks. It is snowing steadily now here at Soldier Field. The weather that everybody from Chicago was hoping for has arrived. <laughs> Not to get theatrical, but I mean, how better can you write a script here for crying out loud? <laughs> Third down, 11 yards to go for Dieter Brock and company. Brock back to pass, the rush on two. Patriots and Chicago Bears were about to make their first visits to the Super Bowl. But the Bears were about to dominate this game as no previous participant had ever done. On January 26, 1986, the New Orleans Superdome became the nation's center of attention as millions of Americans and a worldwide audience witnessed the final chapter in the Bears' incredible season. Chicago spotted the Patriots an early 3-0 lead, but then Jim McMahon combined with Willie Galt, number 83, on one of their many big pass plays. Galt's 43-yard reception set up the first of a trio of field goals from record-setting rookie kicker Kevin Butler. Also posting some notable numbers was the Bears defense, which was on its way to a memorable performance. Number 58 linebacker Wilbur Marshall logged an early drop on the Patriots' Tony Eason, the first of a record-tying seven quarterback sacks. Number 50, Mike Singletary led a defense that held New England to negative yardage until well into the third quarter. Back-to-back first-period fumbles forced by Richard Dent deep in Patriot territory set up two scores that put the Bears ahead for good. One recovery resulted in Chicago's first touchdown, an 11-yard run from fullback Matt Suey, number 26. While Chicago's offense rolled, New England's reeled. They picked up only one first down the entire half and set a record for futility with a net gain of minus 19 yards. Even when the Patriots yanked young Eason for veteran quarterback Steve Grogan, the results were exactly the same, as the Bear defense crafted a performance by which all future Super Bowl champions will be measured. Chicago stormed up the middle. Then they came from the outside, sending number 55 Otis Wilson and friends on a collision course with Broken. <music> Defensive tackle Steve McMichael, number 76, was one of several rampaging bears who turned aside ineffectual New England blocks, then found their way to the Patriot backfield. Leading 23-3 at the half, the Bears began the third quarter backed up near their own end zone. But McMahon hit Galt on a 60-yard bomb that got the Bears out of trouble and put the Patriots on the skids. McMahon, who finished the game with 256 aerial yards, quickly fired a pass to wide receiver Ken Marjoram, number 82 then finished the drive himself with one of two touchdown plunges he scored in the game.
while the defense hadn't quite finished pounding the Patriots. In addition to sacking Grogan for a safety, they also stole two of his passes. This one picked off by cornerback Reggie Phillips, number 48, was returned 28 yards for yet another Bears score. Refrigerator Perry barged in for Chicago's final touchdown. The most one-sided game in Super Bowl history was complete. After 22 years of frustration, Chicago had finally recaptured its place at Pro Football's Summit. They dominated this game and this season as few teams had ever before. Yet the Bears also captured the country's imagination with their flair for excitement and fun. The Bears return home as world champions home to the city in whose image they were created and in whose heart they live. Sure to watch for the official 1985 Chicago Bears team highlight, a 23-minute film sponsored by New York Life Insurance Company.